Hey friends, this is Michael Bohm with Youth Apologetics Training. Today we're going to keep going with this series about the new apostolic reformation, which is also referred to as the NAR. Uh, friends, today we're going to start looking at apostles and prophets. Like I mentioned before, uh, well, in the 80s and 90s, uh, following this new wave, this third wave of uh, Pentecostalism slash hyper charismatic type uh, things happening within the church where people are uh, speaking in tongues and trying to achieve or, or produce signs and wonders. People are starting to, within the church, trying to recreate the events that we see in the book of Acts. Okay, uh, in 2001, uh, C. Peter Wagner, again, one of the most influential people in this movement, the one who actually coined the phrase or named the movement, the New Apostolic Reformation, he marked 2001 as the second apostolic age, uh, when the proper church government, headed by living apostles and prophets, was finally restored. So, in this movement, the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, they believe that the office of apostle and office of prophet is for today. In fact, many believe that if your church does not have this five-fold ministry, the five-fold ministry being uh, the offices of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers comes from Ephesians 4.11. Uh, they believe that if you do not have this five-fold ministry operating in your church, your church is not going to be effective. All right? Uh, well, hmm. I've seen a lot of these ministries with this five-fold ministry uh, in effect, and they're completely ineffective. These ministries are not getting the gospel out. They're teaching all kinds of aberrant false gospels. And then oftentimes you even find out that the head prophet or apostle is involved in some kind of gross sexual sin or scandal, uh, such as Todd Bentley, Prophet Todd Bentley, or uh, for that matter, Paul Cain, one of the founders of this new apostolic reformation, turned out that he was an alcoholic and a homosexual. Ted Haggard, uh, I can't remember if he's an apostle or a, pro or a prophet, but Ted Haggard, also into the five-fold ministry, turned out to be a homosexual. Uh, Earl Polk, all kinds of sexual scandals started popping up around the guy before he died, or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, you know, many of these different great word of faith slash new apostolic leaders, all these scandals start popping up around them. You know, for example, again, like Bob Jones, not to be confused with Bob Jones University, University uh, had all kinds of women coming forward and saying that he was coercing them to come back into his office and they were to disrobe before the Lord. Uh, wait, what? But, uh, what? Okay, sorry. That's craziness. All right, but anyway, you look at the fruit and it's simply not there. Uh, but anyway, this movement believes that uh, apostles and prophets, those offices, are for today. And they get that from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I'm going to read all the way to verse 15, just so you can kind of get a feel for this. And I think there's some important stuff that oftentimes gets glossed over when you're talking to new apostolic reformation types. Okay? It says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some ev evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, oftentimes they stop right there, huh, but they don't go on. And that's where it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now, okay, first of all, 
The New Apostolic Reformation latches on to a couple key words here. Um, in verse 13, we have, Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Uh, when it talks about the unity of the faith, okay, the New Apostolic Reformation is, well, they see that as uh, we have not fully come into the unity of the faith. Uh, rather, the, the Christian faith is very divided, and they're looking forward to a day where everyone is submitting to this network of apostles and prophets. All right? So there you do see a little bit of that element of covering theology that's starting to trickle in here. They're looking forward to a time when the whole world is submitting to this network of apostles and prophets. Now, also, if you read that verse in the NIV, which the NIV often is, is the most popular Bible amongst these circles, I'm just saying, uh, the NIV uh, it says it this way, uh, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Hmm... Until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Okay, so they latch on to that word mature. And they basically, we're looking forward. They are believing that this office of apostles and prophets, in other words, this fivefold ministry, all these offices will stay open until A, unity of the faith is achieved and B, a maturity of the faith. And they interpret that as, uh, well, when somebody is considered mature in faith, they are working in signs and wonders and miracles. Uh, they have submitted to the teachings of the NAR. Uh, they are basically, they're walking in this, this walk of signs and miracles and hearing the voice of God if you will, okay? And that starts getting into breath prayers or contemplative prayer uh, and the like, where you're entering the stillness, you're quieting your mind, and you're hearing, supposedly, the still, small voice of the Lord. And friends, I practiced a lot of this, this stuff when I was part of the hyper-charismatic church as well, where we would all get together, that we would worship the Lord, no problem with that, I guess, um, and then we would get quiet before the Lord, and we would all try to hear His voice, and hey, while we're at it, we would all prophesy over each other, which turned into a train wreck, an utter disaster of false prophecies. I mean, we just we just made ourselves out to be a bunch of false prophets. I can't even tell you how many false prophecies I saw slinging back and forth in that building. Uh, but anyway, so they're looking forward to this unity of the church. Uh, and, of course, they see the unity as in we're all submitting to these apostles and prophets. And this maturity of the faith, which they interpret that as... Everybody is submitting to these prophets. They're hearing words from the Lord, and they are are working in signs and miracles. Okay, they're basically they're they're actively participating in the the more word of faith, hyper charismatic type things. Now, is is that what Paul was trying to talk about? Is that what Paul was saying? Traditionally, uh, that's looked at as these offices were open, especially apostles and prophets. Obviously, there's evangelists, pastors, and teachers today. But these other two offices were open during this time where God needed to put his stamp of approval on the doctrines that they were uh, putting forth. All right? And, by the way, they never false prophesied. They never goofed. They never said something weird. Okay, they didn't have problems like that. God put this uh, the power of the Holy Spirit in them and they God had used them mightily to establish that foundation, that bedrock that we call the Bible, the foundation that has brought the church to the unity of the faith. As in we know the scriptures, we have the Bible, we have uh, the very words of God. And now we can learn about what God wants through his word and thus reach, uh, if you want to put it in the words of the NIV, the maturity of the faith. Right? And that's how it's traditionally been looked at. 
Now, uh, another thing about the new apostolic reformation, uh, there is this hierarchy that happens. I want to read you this quote from C. Peter Wagner about um, apostles. This is what he says, and this is straight from C. Peter Wagner himself. As I mentioned before, this is probably the most radical change. I take literally St. Paul's words that Jesus at his ascension into heaven, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Most of traditional Christianity accepts evangelists, pastors, and teachers, but not apostles and prophets. I think that all five are given to be active in churches today. In fact, St. Paul goes on to say, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And that, friends, is in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. And he goes on, This does not describe a hierarchy, but a divine order. Apostles are first in that order. I strongly object to journalists using the adjective self-appointed or self-declared when referring to apostles. No true apostle is self-appointed. First of all, they are gifted by God for that ministry. Secondly, the gift of its fruit are recognized by peers and the apostle is set set in or commissioned to the office of apostle by the other respected and qualified leaders. All right. He said several things in there that uh, pique our interests. First of all, uh, there is somewhat of a hierarchy that he's speaking about here. Uh, God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, and then it goes on from there. In other words, apostles are the head kahunas in this church, according to C. Peter Wagner. They're the ones who uh, receive words straight from the Lord and angels, and then they relay that to the people. They're the top guys, all right? That's the top tier. Um, so, in the NAR way of thinking, the office of apostle is uh, the top. And they receive all this new revelation from God, and then they, well, they bring it to their congregations, to their people, and they teach people how to apply it in their lives, this new revelation, of which we're going to get into a lot of these new revelations and strange teachings from the new apostolic reformation. And then secondly, below apostles, we have prophets. And this is what C. Peter Wagner has to say about prophets or the office of the prophet. Prophets are prominent in the Bible, both in the Old and in the New Testament. As we just saw above, apostles are first and prophets are second. Every apostle needs alignment with prophets. And every prophet needs apostolic alignment. Covering theology, anyone? Moving on. One of the reasons why both should be active in our churches today is that the Bible says, Surely God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, verse 7. And also, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. I want to prosper. And I want you to prosper. All right, so the office of prophet is second to apostle. A prophet must be aligned with an apostle, covering theology. Uh, and so the prophet, the prophet is similar to the apostle. He receives new divine revelation from, supposedly, from God, all right, and angels. Uh, and so he receives all this new revelation, but it has to line up with whoever they, whatever prophet, or, I'm sorry, apostle that they are uh, submitting to. All right. Oh, boy. You know, and I've seen this. I have seen this where you have all these people who claim to be prophets in the church and uh, they have to submit to their covering who is the apostle, if you will. A lot of times, some in some circles, you don't have that exact structure, but they must submit to whoever's the head. All right, They receive this new revelation, but it has to go in line with their teacher first, and then hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the Bible second. Um, <laughs> and I, and I, okay. And I say hopefully in the sense that at least hopefully they're matching it up with the Word of God. But a lot of times, most of the time, they're not. All right. 
again, just as a reminder, when they do receive, whether it's an apostle or prophet, this new revelation, as long, kind of blending in here into their, their extra biblical revelations, as long as it doesn't contradict the word of God, and B, it comes from somebody who is a recognized a prophet or apostle, that's good enough for them, and there you go. Then whatever they spouted forth is from God. Does that sound like it really should be pastoring the muster of a Christian? Like, should we really be just letting it be that easy? As long as it doesn't blatantly contradict with the Bible, and as long as it comes from a prophet or apostle who has been somehow recognized by the rest of the church, then it's the Word of God? I don't think so. <laughs> Are you serious? No way, man. Uh, yeah, it should line up with the Word of God, but just because it doesn't contradict the Word of God, that doesn't automatically mean it's from God. Come on, let's think a little critically here. But anyway... These prophets are not expected to be 100% accurate in their predictions. I, what? Oy vey, really? Um, going back to the Bible, you know, that old dusty book full of old things, in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. In other words, friends, you don't just start busting out presumptuous prophecies and saying, well, I, I hear the Lord saying this, or I believe the Lord is saying this to his church, or anything like that. Guys, you, I mean, if you claim to be a prophet and you say, thus saith the Lord, or God told me this, or God told me that, and it doesn't come to pass, that makes you a false prophet. End of story. Done deal. And if it was Old Testament times... They'd take you out back and throw rocks at you until you were dead. All right? I mean, this is a big deal. And these people who apparently have no fear of God, no fear of God, will practice prophecy. They will practice uh, this gift of prophecy. In the Old Testament, Samuel, when he was a little kid, all right? And God says, Samuel, Samuel. Was he practicing? Was Samuel just sitting there in the silence and the stillness, listening to a still, small voice? No! God spoke to him, and he heard it, and he was 100% sure of it. When Paul, who is also called Saul, uh, had an encounter with the risen Christ, was he practicing prophecy? Was he practicing hearing a word from the Lord? No, God showed up. You don't practice being a prophet. This is something you don't, I mean, you don't get it wrong every once in a while and then suddenly your, your ratio of good prophecies versus bad gets better and better, all right? That's the kind of nonsense you get from people like Nostradamus and uh, Edgar Cayce and all these others, uh, and Madame Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, all these goofballs out there that are busting out all these false prophecies and every once in a while, kind of like a broken clock, they get something right. Right, you you're either a prophet or you're not. End of story. You either get it right 100 percent of the time, or you, you don't. <laughs> All right, but but they see it as you know you're just practicing. You don't have to have it right 100 percent of the time. And most of these prophets, if not all of them, have uttered false prophecy. Uh, but you're also going to see a lot of these uh, prophets and apostles will will bust out really vague. Prophecies, they're worded so vague, that, vaguely, that you can hardly really pin it down on anything. Uh, and you see that a lot. Uh, nowadays, especially, the more sophisticated your false prophets get, the more they're going to be vague about things. Uh, 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 Nostradamus had this going on. All right, He was really good at making a really vague prophecy, like, the twins shall fall. And suddenly, all these people are like, 
Nostradamus got it right. The Twin Towers, they were hit by planes and they fell. The Twins shall fall. Wow, that, I mean, good grief, man. You could have pinned that just about on anything. You just got to have twins of some sort of kind, something that's similar, and both of them fall. That's pretty cheesy. I, I, come on. And and that's what you're going to see in a lot of these groups. See, now I'm starting to get worked up. Maybe I need to stop. Yeah, I, I have gone a little bit long today. I'll stop right there. Uh, maybe I'll mention a couple more things. Prophets, uh, again, they submit to their apostles. But then under them, you have your pastors, teachers, and evangelists. And they're, you know, they're not as cool. They're down on the totem pole. And they don't get new revelation so much as they receive it from their prophets and their apostles. And then they, well, they disseminate it. They bring it out to the rest of the people. All right, so I'm going to stop right there, friends. Uh, if you like this podcast, if you like what I'm doing, I encourage you to go up to iTunes and leave me a good, uh, re- a good review. Uh, that helps get this message out. And so anyway, hey, if you want to chat about this stuff too, you can catch me on Google+, Plus, Facebook, and Twitter. And with that, I love you guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.